Right. All right, folks, welcome to the Strong for Life podcast. Uh, really excited to share today's guest. It's Ronan Conway, who's a team development uh, uh, expert. Uh, Ronan's from Cork originally, but is based in Wicklow, Ireland. And uh, just really excited to jump into all things teams with Ronan. Uh, so I think a good place to start is actually, what does that even mean? A lot of people are probably listening, not understanding what that com- concept means. Uh, nice one. Thank you for having me on. Um, so regarding teams, I'll just give you a little sense as to what I do. So I work um, as a facilitator. I run team development programs with sports and corporate teams. And so what what is it all about? Well, teams have been in operation since the start of time in many ways, like going back to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, they wouldn't have been having, I imagine they weren't wearing jerseys and whatnot, but they would have actually been operating as a team. So a group of people uh, coming together, cooperating, collaborating towards a shared vision. Um, so, you know, you can talk about the sports and you can talk about workplaces. Uh, those same core principles that were born um, back in the hunter gatherer times are still very uh, much to the fore these days of high performing teams and also healthy uh, environments so uh, yeah how did you get into this line of work because again it's, it's very unique like to be helping teams helping corporations build that kind of sense of community it seems and then perform at a higher level so how did you get into this path yeah um good question i my upbringing was mainly around playing hurling. Like, uh, so since the so as long as I can remember, I had a hurling in my hand from the age of probably three or four. I uh, grew up in Bishopstown in Cork, so I would have played played a lot with my club all the way up to senior level, and had a bit of experience playing for uh, Cork as well. So essentially, I had a lot of experience in various teams, club, county, with my college. I experienced the full range of team culture from very healthy and high performing to not so healthy and not so high performing. Um, same in the workplace, like when I finished my study uh, in commerce in UCC, I would have had a couple of office jobs, some really nice environments, some some uh, challenging. And I suppose over those years, up to my mid-20s, maybe I would have got an idea as to what that healthy high performing team looks like and sounds like and feels like and that really interested me you know I was interested why am I engaging here and I'm not engaging there so that brought me up to my mid-20s uh, 11 years ago Um, I was introduced to a youth organization called the SOAR Foundation Um, so they're a youth charity and they run self-esteem workshops with teenagers I was at that time I was working in my job in IT, which I was very unfulfilled and quite lost, to be honest. Uh, didn't know what I was going to do with myself. And I went along to this a workshop that was run by the SOAR Foundation. And I instantly fell in love with um the craft of facilitation. I saw my old boss Tony Griffin facilitate a workshop with teenagers in schools down in Clare. And I sat down the back and I was my jaw was on the floor. I I was just completely, I had, you know, I had a bit of a aha moment of, right, whatever he's doing up there, I want to be able to do that because that is a really beautiful craft to have. So I quit my job and I moved to Dublin. I started studying psychology um, at night and I started working with SOAR as a facilitator. And eight, eight years later, I was still there um, running emotional intelligence resilience workshops with teenagers all around the country um and all the time really like honing my craft of facilitation understanding group dynamics understanding human needs um understanding what really builds engagement in a in a group um so that that brings me up to four years ago um and then how i started working with teams then was Friend of mine, Kevin Mac, Kevin McMenamin, ex Dublin footballer, uh, he was working with SOAR and he invited me in to uh, work with the Dublin under 20s uh, footballers. 
he said, would you ever try and do what you're doing there with the Sora Foundation and try and do it with the Dublin football under 20s team? Because I think they'll get a lot from it. So I did that, went went well, was invited in to work with Dublin senior footballers and then various some teams in the RFU and various teams around the country in sports. And all of uh, that work rate basically is based on around building connection and a sense of belonging in the in the team environment. Um, that's a long answer to your question. How did I end up doing this? But it's a mixture of learning facilitation skills for the past eleven years, but also uh, leaning on my past experience working or working and playing in teams as well. It's an area that really interests me. Like I, I love, yeah, I love doing that work. I love creating workshops and running workshops that that stimulate belonging and connection and shared purpose and with the eight years i'm curious if you saw any patterns because that was kind of like social media really just came in uh, like so this is like over we'll say 12 years ago and you did eight years with soar is there any sort of things that you came up like working with teenagers was there more self-awareness was there more mental health issues was there any patterns over that eight-year period um, really interesting that like, you know, I I think I worked with like over 10,000 young people, like in hundreds of schools and you think you're starting to see patterns and then you go into a school the next day, just down the road from the previous school and it might be completely different. So unpredictable in many ways, every school you go into, um, but like in terms of patterns and themes, like judgment would be quite a fear of judgment would be a big team in in schools across the board. Um, yeah, fear of judgment. Uh, people wearing masks going into school. You know, people being bringing maybe twenty thirty percent of their real self into school and leaving the rest at home. And in some cases, rightly so. Like, um, uh, yeah, bullying. Well, like I'll give you, to be honest, I'll give you an example of, of I'll try and paint a picture for you. So I'd say it was six years into my time working with SOAR. We went down to, uh, Cam it was a school in the Midlands, mixed school, 100 teenagers. Um, we had been given a spec, spec by the principal saying that there was lots of bullying and lots of mental health issues and anxiety and people were leaving the school people were you know having emotional breakdowns and whatnot so to be honest that wouldn't be too uncommon that a principal would say something like that but in many ways you go in with an open mind anyway so we 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 went down big school hall 100 young people flood into the classroom at one o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning um and they're like who the hell are these people standing in the room and what are we doing but um Essentially, over the course of the three hours, we opened up a discussion with them about about their life, right? So it's like, who are they? Um, who are they beyond the the student? Like, what's going on for them at home? You know, what's family, friends, um, social media, um, what are some of the pressures they're experiencing as? teenagers but what also what are some of the great things they're experiencing as teenagers what are some of the things that light them up and excite them about the present and the future and so it's like that's a very high level description of it so over probably 15 minutes into it like they're still sitting in the chairs and they're like looking at you but some of them very nervous and some of them going what what are we getting ourselves in for here but 20 minutes into it, this girl stood up and she just spoke about um, her fear of judgment and that it cripples her and that sometimes she doesn't come to school because she would prefer to stay at home in her bedroom playing computer games and come in and be judged by a full range of people. Uh, silence in the room, people completely stunned at the level of gravity of what as what she said. Um, and then like one by one people just standing up and putting their hands up, just queuing up to reinforce that they've had a similar experience, okay? People moving from different countries, people being bullied, people with who are taking care of their parents, their sick parents, people losing grannies and granddads and siblings and whatnot. 
So people sharing such vulnerability, teenage, 100 people, 100 teenagers in rooms sharing such vulnerability. Our job then is to facilitate the conversation and make sure that no one's feeling too exposed, but also everybody is learning from each other's stories. And by two hours into the workshop, it's the atmosphere in the room is like nothing you'll ever experience, to be honest. It's like, it's so charged and it's so brimming with empathy and compassion and understanding for each other um it would move you so much to see young people speak like they do in these sessions um and for similar as to the kind of i suppose you could call it an awakening that i had when i watched tony griffin facilitate 11 years ago that's what it's like for the young people when they go into school on those workshop days. They do have a somewhat of an awakening of as to other people have their own unique stories inside themselves and at home. And yeah, it's, it's incredible. So then, yeah. Um, so like all of those teams would probably be spread across a lot of the schools that you work in. Um, judgment, bullying, um, home, family issues, family pressures, academic pressures. And then uh, what, something that I feel people, young people are experiencing a lot at the moment is like sense of isolation after the pandemic, especially. And like, I, I definitely feel for the young people who were in school for, or sorry, who weren't in school for the pandemic. They missed out on two years of relationship building opportunities, skill building opportunities. And sometimes I feel like they're, you know, their emotional intelligence, that, that crop of young people, their emotional intelligence might be a bit impacted by the pandemic. So I suppose that's what sort of now they go in and they try to rebuild those skills for, for the young people and sort of doing great work to this day. Yeah, that's like, it's a really, it's really interesting how vulnerability works because you feel unsafe, so you don't do anything, but then someone has the courage, like that young girl, to open up, and then people, everyone else feels safe then. They're like, oh, okay, she started it, and you guys, I guess, are facilitating that safe space for people to be like, oh, I'm not going to get slagged or bullied by just speaking my truth. Why do you think that is, because vulnerability is so powerful, like when you're open and transparent with people, you feel better, they feel better, and everyone can kind of take off their masks, as you said earlier. But why do you think it's so hard to initiate that in the beginning? Um, why is it difficult? Because, like, I know, I suppose if you, Connor, yourself, myself, think back to our days in school, like, imagine, imagine you have... Four years, sorry, imagine you have like four years of going into school back in back in the day. And sorry, have I lost you? Are you still there? Um imagine you spend four years going into secondary school and there's a certain culture there, and a lot of the time culture and the way of interacting with your classmates, especially for me in our like in boy in my boys' school, personally speaking, the way of interacting with each other was very surface level. It was Talking about sports, talking about games at the weekend, talking about nights out, discos, taking the piss out of each other, uh, taking the piss out of teachers. And like, that's where it operates. That's where the default conversation is. Say, for example, that's at the surface level of the iceberg. To go beneath the surface level is a big change. So it's like, it's a whole new way of being in school. So I, I'm never surprised and I never would argue with any young person for not for finding that difficult to speak beneath the surface level about more personal topics. Um, also, it's a cultural thing. It's not just a school culture. It's like a societal thing. I, I feel like, you know, how we interact with a lot of our people in our lives is on a surface level. And that's fine. You know, that serves us. But what I do find is that when we stay at the surface level and we stay above the surface level and we never learn what's beneath the surface level and we never learn how to speak beneath the surface level and we never learn how to hold somebody when they speak beneath the surface level, we're missing out on so much. Um. Yeah, but 
what what I find there's a lady called Amy Edmondson and she's the a thought leader in psychological safety. Um and she speaks about interpersonal risks. How do you build safety in an environment, in a workplace, in a sports team, in a classroom? Um, she speaks about it's interpersonal risks build that safety. So what she means by that is somebody putting up their hands, somebody making suggestions, somebody offering an opinion, offering feedback, saying, you know what, I actually don't know what the answer is to this question. All of those little steps of vulnerability are what she calls interpersonal risks. Similar to the girl that was down in the Midlands in that school, she took an interpersonal risk. And when she did that, it gave everybody else in the room permission to do similar because they realized that when she took the risk, she was praised, she, it was welcomed, she wasn't slated, she wasn't judged. If she was judged at all, she was judged for being an absolute courageous legend, right? Um, so it's just that reframing that occurs when somebody speaks of vulnerability. It's people, it can be scary, but when it occurs in a room, and I've seen this for 11 years straight, when it occurs in a room and it's welcomed and people hold the person who's being vulnerable, you can almost see the lights go on in everyone else's mind around the room going, that is strength. That is not weakness, that is strength. And we speak about it a lot in social, like people speak about that a lot in social media and say vulnerability is strength. But I think sometimes you have to be in a room with a friend, a family member or a team to experience that and be like, right, now I know it's a strength. And then for someone who, because like, I don't think it's just, you know, in, in secondary school, like it's hard in general, like it's hard to put yourself out there or if no one else is putting up their hand or speaking up. So what would be some tools or tips you could give someone listening? And they're like, they feel like maybe they're just not speaking up about what they need to speak up about or uh, not able to engage. Would there be any initial steps rather than just kind of yeah. coming out with, with everything? Yeah. Um, yeah, like that's a very, it's a broad one because like there's so many different, I'm definitely not standing here saying that everyone should be vulnerable in every situation because that's actually not the truth. Like um, I'll take a workplace example. I spoke to, maybe this will paint a picture. I spoke to a manager of, it was a multinational last week that I'm working with. And he said to me, he said to me, I feel like the wind has been taking out, taken out of the sails of, of my team since the pandemic. We've never actually fully like caught flight. Um, people are dropping out with stress and, and whatnot. And also our team aren't collaborating. So what I did was I actually just sat him down and I gave him a couple of points as to what I think he can do to foster a safe environment in his workplace. And there's a couple of points that I made. And first one is building belonging. So there's a guy called Daniel Coyle and he wrote the book, uh, Culture Code. And he mentions a lot in the book about belonging cues. So we, when we are in an environment, say a workplace environment, like this multinational, in this workplace environment, the employees are scanning their environment to answer the question, do I belong here? And when we feel like we belong in our work environment, for example, our nervous systems are more regulated, we're more at ease, we're more relaxed, um, we're less worried about the dynamic and are we fitting in? Or do people not like us and whatnot? And we're more able to lock into the task at hand. So Daniel Coyle mentions belonging cues like eye contact, body language, um, using somebody's name, um, all of these, all of these cues signal to to an employee that they belong in the environment and that they can that they're a part of the mission. Um, that's one point I'd say. I'd say for other leaders, I'd say um, encourage people to take interpersonal risks. So when you're running a meeting or a one to one session or a meeting invite and encourage people to take interpersonal risks in their team um so instead of the old maybe traditional way of standing at the top of the room and talking 
at a group, telling them how things are, ask them how things are, invite their opinions, invite their ideas, um, invite feedback. And maybe it might be quiet at the first time you try this, but after a while, people will get used to the fact that you want to actually hear from them. Um, and yeah, that's inviting interpersonal risks. And did, 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 yeah, I know I didn't answer your question there, Connor, but like I, I'm suppose I, I'm speaking from more the leader's perspective there and how yeah. they can for it. But like if you are a team member and you're thinking, should I should I be speak? How can I speak up a little bit more? It's like any muscle, like you when you're going to the gym, uh, whatnot, and you're exercising, you're building a new muscle. This is no different. This is the muscle of expression. Um, and if you're in a meeting or you're in a one-to-one -one meeting with a colleague and you say, you know what, I have something to say here, I'm going to chance it and put my hand up. Um, and then if the world doesn't collapse around you after you've made the suggestion, maybe you, then the next time you'd be like, I'll throw my hand up again. So it's all like it's practice. And just on that, like when, when I tried, when I facilitated for the first time 11 years ago, my God, I was shivering in my boots like for two or three years going into schools to speak in front of a group. It's not easy. Definitely not easy. It still, it still makes me really nervous. Like, <laughs> but uh, I do feel like just a bit of jumping on the water slide, just saying, you know what, here we go. I'm going to take a risk here and see what happens. Yeah. And I think, as you said, like just small little exposures and then you realize you're still alive, you're okay. And then, you know, the next step on the ladder, uh, as you kind of get that positive reinforcement, Exactly. Yeah. yeah let's switch gears a bit mate let's talk about the soda bread box what is that and how did that come to be oh yeah um so i'm probably going to confuse the listeners here they'll be like well oh, that's a different one <laughs> but this, <laughs> yeah, this is um when is this this so basically soda bread box is a, a dance night that myself and my uh good friend dermot sexton uh set up around 11 years ago and we, we, I suppose we were subscribing to, like, we love going on our nights out, like a lot of people would. Um, and we had really good, nice times of festivals and nights out and whatnot. And there was one winter there and we were thinking, you know, it would be lovely to actually just dance without having to go to a festival or invest on a, and commit to a big night out. Uh, let's, uh, Let's try set up a dance night. So I had heard about this place over in Australia and um, that was running dancing on a dark nights. And I was thinking that sounds interesting, but I probably wouldn't ever do it. So myself, my three housemates at the time, we went into the kitchen on some cold, wet November Tuesday night and we turned off the lights and we put on some music and we had a dance uh, for around 20 minutes. And it was absolutely great crack. We turned on the lights after 20 minutes and there was a lot of sweaty faces. There was a couple of knocked over chairs. There was a lot of smiling faces. And uh, we just had great fun. And we said, you know what, let's set it up. So myself and Dermot Sexton, we set it up in, in Dublin, uh, a Dancing in the Dark Night. And we ran it for two and a half years, I think. We ran like 50 events, I think. And uh, every Monday night, um, every second Monday night, um, a bunch of dancers would come. And when I say dancers, just normal people after work, after college, people coming on their own, people coming in groups, all shapes and sizes and nationalities. And and we would, they'd come into the room, we'd switch off the lights, we'd give a little introduction and we'd say, just have fun and watch out with your elbows, don't hit on it. <laughs> and, uh, and we'd put on music for an hour, all sorts of different tunes and people would dance essentially whatever way they wanted without that fear of judgment. And uh uh for me personally it was incredibly liberating experience to run it because you know i'm in there dancing with everyone else of course but uh it just made me think about when i am on a night out and i'm dancing how much of my how much am i actually going for it and moving to the music like i really want to and how much am i actually dancing just to kind of uh be a chameleon like match everyone else and kind of not go too you know, wild with it. So yeah, it was a big learning curve regarding 
yeah, just letting go and enjoying the music and having a bit of fun and enjoying the music for what it is. Um, you know, yeah. So that that's cool. We did it for two and a half years, and uh, it was a little side project. It wasn't a job. It was just a side project on the on the side. Yeah, it's super interesting you're saying it, man. Like, because I was saying to you just before we went live about uh, start. I started dancing last year, so I've just kind of just gone over a year with doing salsa or bachata latin dancing it's very like salsa yeah. and uh part of the reason was at the end of 2022 i asked myself like what would i regret when i'm 80 85 and i was like for me when i would be in a social environment dancing i would feel uncomfortable even though i wanted to move i would feel uncomfortable because i of judgment um and it was judgment towards myself as well, which is the irony. Like it wasn't other people looking at me, but I didn't feel safe, I guess. And then I started dancing over the last year and it's been amazing. It's been such a fun experience. Um, and also now, like I was at a festival in summer in Ireland with my friend and my sister. And, uh, you know, I wasn't drinking for the whole weekend. I was just, just had fun dancing. So it's like, like much more freedom. Um, okay. And something I'm very interested in, if you know anything about it, I'd be curious in your thoughts, like rhythmic movement mm -hmm. and just like stress and also just the historically, like every kind of culture has some sort of a dance culture within it as well. So there's definitely something to it. Like I'm really enjoying exploring this a lot more I'm only obviously a year in. But yeah, do you have any, have you explored any of that, like from a... Uh, stress or therapeutic standpoint um no i haven't you know but like i've definitely over the years running the event we definitely we did it we we ran it at a couple of different health and well-being festivals like so i definitely like have tapped into a little bit of the emotional and physical benefits of dancing and movement like they're certainly there i wouldn't be one to ask be asked about the research but it's there but um i like i i some nights when I would have left Soda Red Box or some when I would have experienced it, I, I would have honestly pictured people dancing around the fire for the last, you know, 10,000 10, years. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, people coming, friends, family, but like strangers dancing together. There's something about it, the non-verbal nature of it. The fact that you don't have to say a thing um, that uh is is very ancient and in us all and the fact that it's ancient i believe it has you know it should be good for you if it's if it's ancient and it's natural um and it goes but you know even the interpersonal risks you know like going back to that as well it's like oh if someone if someone starts dancing a bit looser and they start moving their upper body their lower body a bit looser it gives other people around them a bit of freedom to do the same it's really really interesting um but like you know there there is people coming to soda red box who still you know when i meet them in the street they'll come up and say like you know what that actually gave me so much like because you know they'll say some of the highs that they got the endorphin highs uh, and the natural highs that they got from dancing uh in a fully liberated way like has still left an impact on them so yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's to be to be experimental with. It's not everyone's cup of tea, no, definitely. But yeah. uh, it's, it, you know, it's it's uh, it's definitely different. But I think if you want to try something different and you want to do it in a, if you don't want to wake up with a huge hangover in the, the next day, you know, there's so many dance nights out there that you can go and and do that. Like, uh, so it's uh, again, it's taking that risk, signing up. Yeah. Up, what happens? Don't go back if you yeah. don't like. Yeah, it. <laughs> uh, it's also I found. Uh... Like if I was very tired, I'd go dancing and then we'll say the girl I was dancing with, she might be tired as well. But then afterwards, we both feel great versus like if two people come together sometimes and you just kind of vomit on yourselves with regards to all your problems, uh, you're both even more drained. So it was like, oh, this is a very nice, like negative energy come together. And then it's just like you kind of get it all off and you're just you're you're like super energetic at the end of it, which is. Very interesting. I like really, uh, very state. therapeutic. Yeah. Sorry. It can really change your state. Like you can walk into exactly. a room. You can leave a completely different way. Like it's uh, fascinating. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to Let's... hear you have a good time with it. 
Okay. It's so good, man. Yeah. It's really funny as well, because like I would be under the category in coaches as like a, a movement coach, you know, like someone like uh, mobility and movement. And then when I started dancing, I was like, oh, man, my movement is so bad, <laughs> you know. So it's just been very humbling as well, like balance, body control, awareness. Like it's yeah, dancers are just so far ahead from a, a movement ability standpoint of probably dancers and martial artists and gymnasts are like just so far ahead of, of other areas. Um, it's it's really, it's great to hear that you went to the festival last summer then, and then you felt like your dancing was being integrated into your, into your life then, you know, isn't that, yeah. I wonder what other parts of your life it, it integrates into apart from just dancing then. It's uh, I'm sure there's probably other areas, I imagine. Big time. Yeah. Because another thing that came up was like, there's a lot of um, like if you talk to guys in particular in, I guess, ballroom, any dance when you're leading. So like most of the like Latin dance, the, the man leads the woman. Um, it's very stressful at the start because you need to lead, even though you don't really know what you're doing. So you can be in your head a lot because like you're dancing with your with your partner you're not really sure you're making mistakes and there was just always this criticism um over the first few months where i was like man you're an idiot like you're doing it all wrong she thinks you're an idiot she thinks you can't dance all of these dialogues and then like after three months i was like i'm just judging myself like she isn't judging me at all this is all just me my inner critic and i was like oh wow like that's just like a slap in the face being like that pattern is or that part is coming up in probably everything I'm doing that I feel I'm not doing very well. So that was like, really, it's just a real aha moment as well. Like working through that. Yeah. And the, uh, what you made me think or help me remember there was when, when someone asked myself and Dermot to describe a uh, soda bread box, we actually got a testimonial off a client, sorry. And they said, uh, soda bread box helped me get out of my mind, you know? And like, if someone read that, <laughs> Uh, headline they'd probably be saying geez what's going on there but like that, <laughs> like the dancing it does help you get out of your mind like out of your judgment out of your criticism out of your doubt out of your negative self-talk like and into your body like and that's yeah beautiful so let's switch gears to high performance so high performance teams like you worked with dublin you've worked with irish rugby um what have you seen change when these guys feel more connected or more of a community versus like a bunch of individuals leading? Um, yeah, so like the high performance, and I, I actually, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I'm a guru in high performance. That's first and foremost, you know. Um, I feel like I bring a certain skill to the pot, like to be mixed in, but. Like in the area of high performance, there's, you know, the physical, there's the tactical, there's the technical, and then there's the cultural. Um, mine would be under the pillar of cultural. Um, you know, players, such high pressure, elite sport, like inter-county, international, even, you know, the club team game is so, it's getting so competitive. So they're under pressure to you know, perform each week and to train well and to there's stats, there is analysis, there is there's a lot going on for players at the moment. Um so the programs that I run with teams are essentially like a series of workshops over the course of the season where I meet them, you know, maybe after big games, before big games. And it's just a, a chance for them to come together and to connect. Um and what I mean by connect is like reflect and discuss topics relating to personal life, but also their sports life. Um, I was, I'm not sure if you've seen um, uh, The Last Dance, um, Michael Jordan documentary. Um, I haven't actually seen it. Yeah. I've heard a lot about it, but I haven't seen it. Uh, but F Phil, uh, Phil Jackson, the coach, like would have employed a lot of similar uh approaches then i'd work with teams uh, and what he did with the bulls the chicago bulls before their their last dance was he brought them into a room and he had chairs around in a circle and he had a tin can in the middle of the room 
and he asked everybody in the room to write what this team means to them. And so they all took a pen and paper, they wrote it, tore up the paper, put it into the tin can in the middle of the room. Phil Jackson did the same. Um, each of them, before they put it into the tin can, they would have read it out to the rest of the team. So you would have had people speaking about, like, this is my family. They would have said, like, you know, this means the world to me. I don't want the season to end. Um, I think Michael Michael Jordan wrote a, some kind of a poem just saying, like, at the end of it, he said, like, let's just go out there and finish this story. Something to that nature. So then Phil Jackson turned off the lights and he set fire to the tin can, what was in the tin can, and the players just sat and watched it burn away. Um, and yeah, some of the players were quoted as saying it's one of the most powerful things they've ever seen in their life. So it's like, the reason I gave that example is it's been done all around the world in some ways, but um, there's something quite, uh, there's something powerful about bringing a bunch of athletes, 40, 30, 40 people into a room and having quite meaningful conversations about what this team means to them, who they're playing for, what motivates them, what are some of the challenges they're experiencing on the field, off the field. And instead of doing that uh, in their own heads or one-to-one, -one, you're actually having that conversation with a bunch of 40 people. And it, it it's some of the most charged and beautiful scenes I've ever witnessed in my whole life is watching some of these high performing teams actually engage uh, like that. And, you know, by the end of it, when people say the phrase, they go through a wall for each other, they literally will go through an actual wall for each other after having conversations like that. Um, uh, but then that's the job then it's to try and it's not to get them too ramped up it's actually just hold it in a really composed way like you know just hold that power that they've just experienced in the room and bring that into their into next week's game and whatnot um, and then the whole point of doing that work is actually like why would you build a connection it's not just to have this, this warm fuzzy feeling or, or powerful feeling in a room it's so that they can collaborate and cooperate effectively on the pitch you know you see these elite teams like you know at the moment the Limerick Curlers um Dublin footballers Ireland rugby um the list goes on but like they almost have this telepathic relationship with their with their teammates and like they don't even you know they are so in tune with each other and so trusting of each other and they feel so safe with each other that uh it's like there's these invisible strings going between them like and they're just like really tied together on and off the pitch and that's what you're trying to do in these workshops build those ties up um so that they can do it behind the white lines that's it yeah yeah it's very cool man just just before i ask the next question on the him burning the paper what was the significance of that um <clears throat> what i took from that was one all of the team got a chance to actually verbalize what, what this whole journey means to them. So by hearing other people's, uh, what other people, what, by hearing other people's stories in those moments, all of the other players will have more to play for. So when they hear that they're playing, person A, Johnny's playing for family, um, Michael Jordan's playing for friends and teammates. It's like you all start playing for each other's motivations, and so you have more to play for than yourself. Um, which is one of the motivations. But also, what I took from it was the passing of time, and that the transience of life and the transience of the sporting journey. That like we just had this conversation two seconds ago. Now we're burning it. The game is going to be over just as fast. So like, what do you want to do? Do you want to, yeah, what do you want to do? It's going to be over. So what do you want to do? And like, usually when you ask a question to people like that, and they'll say, now's the time. Now's our time. You know, mm. does that make sense? It does totally. It's actually the next thing I wanted to talk about is your work in prisons, but also um, like Gaber Mate's course as well. And everything you're talking about, like connection, collaboration, 
it's staving off issues with like loneliness when we talked uh, i think before christmas like i was saying like, i struggled with loneliness in australia and then like working online and then when i started dancing and that's actually helped a huge amount like that sense of belonging and community um and i think a lot of people struggle with that sense of disconnection and i think you might have said this to me on the last time we talked but like the opposite of addiction is disconnection um as uh, as a uh, that quote i can't remember his name but yeah yeah exactly so like the work you're doing man obviously it's great for you know sports team performance people in the corporate world but like it seems very much just important for everyone um mm -hmm. how are you thinking about that like from a, a broader societal perspective uh thanks yeah thanks for asking the question it's uh it's actually like it's good to reflect on because it would be something i'd reflect on the odd time i've and I'm, i think i'll always be reflecting on this why am i doing this work you know and but like for eight years working with teenagers i've never spent that long working in any job by the way but i think what kept me there was like the magic moments that you would see um Sorry, the, ma the magic moments that you'd see with young people uh, when they feel uh, like they're connected and they feel like they're belonging and valued by their classmates. Right. Some people will say, yes, they're building self-awareness and whatnot. But like for me, like. Looking at that, sometimes I was thinking this is life changing for some young people. These conversations could, will change the rest of their school, hopefully experience. But it might change the rest of their lives, you know, um, and I feel like, you know, it's so central. We're heart, we're relational beings, and it, like the connection is so central to our well-being and to our nervous system regulation and just feeling at ease and at peace with ourselves. Um, yeah. So from a broader societal like you know i i feel like this work is relatable to to any any area you know sometimes i get calls from universities or you know youth organizations or you know sports teams and prison and whatnot and uh in some ways i think like geez i'm i'm just I'm, I'm working with all these different areas what am i but like i you know if i can build a bit of connection in all of these areas i, I feel like people are genuinely hungry for it like and, and Connor, by the way, can you remember the pandemic, right? When people were on Zoom calls with friends doing quizzes and doing, you know, all of these different games on, on Zoom, right? I remember watching some of my friends, including myself, people almost crawling through the screen to just have that bit of connect. It's like, yeah. oh, what are, what are they saying? Are, oh, how are they, you know, just really locked in. I, I remember seeing that going, oh my God, we are such relational beings here. Like we are so braving it right now. And like the pandemic definitely shone a light on that. Like, and I think we shouldn't forget about that. Like, because yes, things have gone back to the new normal, as I say, but like, let's not forget about how much we missed it. Like uh, when the pandemic was happening. Um, yeah. And you know, like from a workplace perspective, one in four workers in Ireland were working remotely before the pandemic. Four in five workers are working, sorry, hybrid um, post-pandemic. Okay, so if four in five, four in five people are working hybrid post-pandemic in Ireland, you know, how are organizations working to keep people, uh, keep that sense of belonging, keep that, you know, sense of engagement, uh, with their employees and, and like how you know how are they actually working to ensure that that worker's well-being is still their emotional cup is going to be filled up you know and people are doing great work on that area and like corp organizations are doing great work but I do feel like the hybrid work and the remote work is having probably a silent uh, impact on a lot of people um, I've even noticed it since I moved out to Wicklow a couple of months ago I was working in Dublin uh, in shared working places for, for years. Moved out to Wicklow. Now I'm working at the kitchen table for the last two months. And 
by by the time Wednesday comes along Thursday, I'm like, oh, I need to get out and meet people. Like, yeah, you know, it's pretty real. Like, it really is. I'm like, I need to get out and chat. To <laughs> like, yeah, even if I just go down to Circle K and chat to someone behind the desk, <laughs> behind the counter for two minutes, I'll do it. But, uh, yeah, it's actually amazing, like the impact that has. Because uh, similar to yourself, I I was just working um at home or working online. And then last year I started working in a co-working space and I was like, whoa, this is like, this makes such a difference. Cause it's even just a small little converse, conversations, like you, you might know the person, but like you see them every day, you have a quick chat. Uh, it makes a big difference over the course of three, six months versus just being at home, <laughs> you know, and not like having those engage, engagement conversations. Um, I mean, I'm conscious of time, so like, just want to finish with some rapid fire. We won't get to the uh, the prison stuff today, so maybe we'll have to. I think around two would be good if you're open to it. Um, given the choice of anyone in the world, who would you like to sit down with over dinner for two to three hours to pick their brain? That is a good question. Um, there's a few people, a few people I'd love to, I'd love to, I'm a huge Eddie Vedder fan. <laughs> uh, Eddie Vedder is the lead singer of Pearl Jam. Ah, got yeah. it. Um, always a big fan of him. I like him as a person, love his music. I'd actually love to pick his brain on his lyrics. Um, uh, yeah, there's a couple of tunes there that I yeah are imprinted into my mind, like, and I'd love to actually just sit down and chat to him about his lyrics. Um, yeah, um, do, do, do. you know what I like? I like Jurgen Klopp, the Liverpool manager. Um, I really like his philosophy. I like how he holds himself. I like how. I like his range as a human being. He he's got such amazing range. Like he he can lay down the law with the players, but two minutes later he'll have his hand around them, around their shoulder, and like actually just be comforting them or encouraging them. And then he's he seems to be great crack, like and there's a fantastic smile and it's just like really magnetic character. Um and seems to be like do a lot more beyond the football field. So yeah, he'd be another person. Um right. Yeah. What's your greatest accomplishment to date, would you say? Um, uh, I I would do do a greatest accomplishment. I would say it would be related to to facilitation so like as I said like when I fell in love with the craft of facilitation like 11 years ago uh, I I think my greatest accomplishment is just sticking at it and like staying curious and staying learning uh, about how to run these sessions better and better and better every year that I do them um, uh, because the way I think about facilitation is the more the better the better I can be as a facilitator the more people are going to get from the experiences so i'm just happy i stuck at it um and the journey the journey continues there's more to learn but like yeah I th I'm, I'm proud of that yeah awesome mate what have you changed your mind on recently and um, we'll say in the last year hmm um Uh, probably moving to the countryside. Uh, I lived in Dublin for 10 years in the city and served me well. Great fun. And like met so many people and like <laughs> it's where I'm in Australia, but I'm only a half an hour away, but it feels very different. Like I think I, I had kind of ruled out a move to the countryside and then uh, myself and my girlfriend uh, said we'd take the chance there three months ago. And it's different. Like there's chickens clucking outside the window here. Uh, which wouldn't be normal in Dublin, but I'm glad I I'm glad I've taken the risk so far, and it's nice to try something different.
Yeah, we. I was saying to you, my sister lives close to you. I'd never been to Wicklow before because we're from Clare. Uh, it's lovely and it's very close to Dublin. So it's like kind of a win-win, like you're not in the city either. Last question, mate. If you could put anything on a billboard in Times Square to reach millions of people, what would it be and why? Yes. Uh, my dad gave me a bit of advice there around... When I, uh, when I was 20, I, yeah, he, yeah, he said, he said to me, treat everyone like they're your brother or sister. And it's the best bit of advice I've ever got, like received. Uh, and it's, uh, I don't know, I, 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 I feel like if people put others, if someone's annoying you at work or, pisses you off on the bus or is rude to you or cuts you off in traffic or you know whatever they can be valid reasons to be annoying but like I think if we can remember that people are trying their best and they're someone's brother or sister and they're someone's son and daughter and they're someone's mom and dad sometimes it's uh I think we can build that rel relatability a little bit and we can also build that sense of empathy and just like cut each other a bit of slack we're all trying our best I feel, um, to survive in this world, like, and to get by. And, uh, yeah, I just remember, try to remember that. Probably what I'd say. So, every, uh, yeah, treat others like they're your brother or sister. Yeah, man, that's a good place to end and just kind of having that empathy for prob the way people are acting is probably because of where they've come from most of the time, exactly. right? the majority of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Actually, awesome, man. Great to chat, mate. Yeah, great to connect. Uh, shout out to Patrick Cusick for putting us in contact. And uh, where can people learn more about you, about what you do? Where's the best place to look at yeah. what you've got so going on? I have a website which was designed by that man, Dermot Sexton, who I mentioned from the dancing. Um, <laughs> website is uh, roninconway.ie, and then I make the odd post and contribution on linkedin ronan conway and uh yeah that's it for now really um, awesome man but a uh, really I nice chat. likewise man yeah i'll put all that in the show notes uh so people can find your stuff there okay Thank you very much pleasure